What is up, watch fam? I am Christian, the curator of the Theo and Harris Watch Shop, and today I'm being joined by Cameron from Craft and Tailored. Cameron. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me, Christian. It, really excited about uh, this discussion. Thanks for coming, man. So we're gonna be talking about a host of different you know, issues. We're actually gonna be doing two episodes here because I know we're gonna run long. It's Corona, everyone's home, or at least most people are home. So let's give them a, a ton of content to consume. Uh, we're talking about you know, Cartier, talking about Rolex. Uh, Cameron knows a hell of a lot about the Paul Newman Daytona. So we're gonna be talking about the, the Daytona market. Uh, this is gonna be great, so let's do it. Let's do it, let's dive into it. Boom watch fan. So before we jump into our wristwatch checks, uh, I'm wearing a Cartier tank, by the way, phenomenal watch. Looking forward to seeing what you've got on your wrist cam. Um, I just want to talk for a second. Um, this is obviously this bizarre time. Uh, no one really knows which way is up. Um, but the one thing that we do know is we're in a terrific community, right? It, it's, it's been so awesome uh, to look for the silver lining, to, to focus back on, on watches, uh, make new friends in this community. And recently, Cam and I became you know, better acquainted and we hopped on the phone just last week and we had this awesome conversation uh, and it was Cam that said, hey, let's, let's do this, let's record this, let's hang up the phone right now and save the good stuff for yeah. everyone on YouTube. So Cam, I'm supposed to be the YouTube guy, but you're the one that made this happen, so thank you so much. Yeah, of course, man. I think it's a I think it's a great idea, and I think what's interesting about this is, um, you know, uh, we're talking watches, we're talking about some interesting things, and I think that uh, this is a perfect time to talk about it during kind of this quarantine period while everybody's at home, and um, there's some interesting things happen happening. So uh, I think that this is a perfect time to kind of record a, a watch hang, virtual watch chat, whatever you want to call it. I, I agree. Well, let's get into it. Cool. Let's do it. All right, so I am wearing a, uh, you know, actually you go first because you're the guest. So what are you wearing on your wrist? You know, so um, there might be some like diehard vintage fans that are going to get mad at me, but I'm actually wearing a Tudor Black Bay 58 that's in my personal nice. collection. Uh, nice. Funny story about the, the Black Bay 58. I had one that a customer um, had traded in to me and uh, I did a video on it uh, with our VR YouTube. And funny enough, for a while, it was like the, the video that got the most attention, the most views and the most feedback. Isn't that funny? Yeah, right. Like you, can, you can get Paul Newman's in hand and you can get all these crazy watches. And right. the Tudor Black Bay 58 is to get, you know, gets the most views. It's great. It's, it's funny, right? It's like, oh, here's this like piece unique or this is a Paul Newman. And it did yeah. it. And then like the Black Bay gets the most views, right? So. Um, the funny thing is that I was planning on keeping that one for myself because I, I like the, the, the format of the watch and I'm a big fan of Tudor. And of course, it, the watch like sold right away. And so I was like, okay, well, I'll probably get another one. And then of course, they're just not available. And so right. same thing happened. A customer reached out and he offered me one that he um, had signed up on a list for or something. And this was a duplicate for him. So I, I ended up getting this one uh, you know, from a, from a good customer on bracelet, but I really love the watch. It's incredible. And it's kind of been the watch that I've been wearing. Um, you know, it's, it's something that I don't really have to worry about. It kind of reminds been, me of you've like You've been wearing a it in crown. quarantine. It's, it's been your apocalypse watch. It's my apocalypse watch. Yeah. So, uh, it's kind of funny, I guess. Um, you know, this being a, a modern watch, it definitely has that like throwback kind of heritagey kind of feel. It reminds me of like a big crown sub red triangle sure. insert and kind of the rose sure. gold guilty type of features. What are you wearing? Right now, so I'm wearing the exact opposite of an apocalypse watch. I'm wearing a, uh, a Cartier Tank Centre from the 1950s. Okay. I, I guess if I was going to be a little bit more, uh, you know, didactic, I'd say a Centre, you know, like everyone says on, on Instagram. Most uh, yeah, but uh, no, it's, it's a really cool watch. Uh, I've wanted one of these watches for a while. I think that uh, just just the, the thinness of the case and the way it curves is just incredible. Um, there are, I, so I really wanted one of these watches for a while. And one, they're, they're quite difficult to find. And Most, two, yeah. I really don't... I like the medium size. I don't like the large, and, and the small is too small for me, uh, even me. Um, but but I don't I don't love the most common dial, which has a thinner those thinner numerals. They're great. Right. Um, I just always kind of wanted something a little bit bulkier. Obviously, in the Cartier world, you know, as well documented as it, as it is because of certain thought leaders that really read to the research, it's still pretty crazy out there, right? Cartier still, I mean, it can surprise you. So uh, so anyway, I found this really beautiful example from from another dealer. 
and I was super happy to add it to my collection. Uh, it's a watch that, I mean, you know this. I mean, it's, it's a watch that uh, you know, brings me a ton of joy. Who knows if, if I'll keep it forever. I don't, I don't know if it's a watch that, that I'll die with. Um, but I, yeah, and the only reason I say that is because I am at my core a Cartier collector. So for yeah. me, it's, it's going to be just this like lifetime of collecting this brand. And while I like to keep as many as I can, I also know that revolving that door allows me to, you know, acquire and experience all these different models. So um, who knows what will happen, but I'll always have multiple Cartier in my collection. You know, what's funny is you, you are kind of one of the influences on me as a dealer and as a collector with Cartier. I would say I've, I've, I've been a fan of Theo and Harris for a long time and follow your Instagram and obviously watch all the videos and stuff. But what's interesting is, um, you know, I'm like, oh, Christian's really into Cartier. And then I started kind of looking deeper into Cartier and I'm like, oh crap, like I'm yeah, down that rabbit hole. I've been looking yeah. at a lot of Cartier. Matter of fact, um, the, the one of the watches that um, I have is, uh, I actually have it here with me, but it's uh, the Tank Automatic from the yeah. 1970s. And yeah, I have one as well. We're, we're both playing with Tank Automatics today. That's awesome. Uh, it's such an incredible watch and they're pretty rare. You know, they're not, they're a little bit on the harder to find side. But what's funny is um, they make this reference in white gold and I'm now like on this quest to find one in white gold. And they even came from the factory with like this white gold mesh bracelet that is just like super incredible. So. I definitely knew the white gold jumbo existed. I did not know that one existed on a bracelet. I just learned something new. I, I, I've never seen it. Please send, please, well, here's a photo, boom, for everyone else, but please send me that photo so I can take a look at it. Yeah, no, I will for sure. And, um, you know, uh, John Goldberger is obviously, he has an incredible Cartier collection. I think he has one yeah. in his collection. Uh, yeah, hi, John. Sure. Uh, but um, yeah. I think he has one in his collection on the white gold, like mesh bracelet. It's just, yeah. it's incredible. So. Yeah, it's crazy. So John, the first time that I ever met, not, not, that, not that we were friends, but you know, we see each other at the auctions, let's say in, in uh, December at Phillips and everything. And obviously, yeah. you know, Goldberger is a legend. You know, he's the, was one of the most interesting like guys ever. Uh, he has you know, the most incredible first... style. Like when that guy walks in, in, yeah. in the room, you're like, all right, this guy's serious. Like, you, oh, you know, absolutely. it's just everything. From from like the like the denim like you know it, it knit fisherman's cardigans to the you know to to the corduroy pit, to, to the Belgian shoes what everything he does is just so um, interesting you know it, it's not obvious it's just so and and that that obviously goes into watches and then it goes into furniture like it, sometimes he'll post photos of like his house just to like show just not, not how much money it is but just how interesting it is and For I sure. love like his eclectic nature it's just so beautiful and people don't like see that so much because you know they've seen the Hodinkee episode which was super famous and yep. then you know they I guess they just don't follow him regularly on Instagram he doesn't have that big of an Instagram like the Instagram is mm. pretty small you know which is hysterical but, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, he has, he has amazing taste. And I think the thing that's cool yeah. too, you know, I'm inspired. The thing that's great about watches for me, especially vintage watches is that, you know, I'm always inspired by other, other, you know, dealers and other, and other people. I, sure. I think that obviously yeah. you and I are, are probably inspiring people not to like toot our own horn, but like looking no, at something and, and seeing something and then kind of like, bringing that into, into the into the, the light of the world going like, hey, this is why this yeah. is cool, I, I think is part yeah. of a little bit of what we do. But I'm also inspired by other people like, you know, Goldberger, for example, and, you know, his style and his taste, especially with, with vintage watches, sometimes it's not really that expensive. Sometimes it's like something that is cool and you're like, wait, how much is that? Why is this not 10x the price? Absolutely. This is so cool. Absolutely. He just posted, not, not, to, not to harp on Goldberger for all this time, but he just posted a photo yesterday of, um, of a white gold Eterna on a white gold bracelet, a watch that you would never expect people, you know, to be on like this uber collectible account. Uh, and yet he genuinely couldn't care less about what people think of, you know, of a particular watch. He just knows that that's an incredible thing. Yeah, maybe the brand isn't super famous, but the watch itself is, is beautiful. It's a lovely watch. Yeah, hundred percent. Very cool. Yeah, and I think a lot of that comes from, you know, people like you and people like me who are lucky enough to handle so many of these things and whether we own them or, or a friend owns them or whatever, you know, you, you start to really, you have the opportunity to develop your own taste you know, as opposed to just going with the mainstream. Uh, and, and that's where things get really interesting for me. Whereas yeah, when you I think see a couple of watches, you don't have the opportunity. Yeah. I think the thing too, uh, about some of this stuff is 
at least for me, it, I think the taste comes from perspective. So it's ex, it's actually experiencing these things and kind of having that um, that emotional kind of tangible response to it, which will allow you to appreciate something like the white gold of Turner, right? That Goldberger posted, right? I right. think it's a lot of different watches and a lot of different things that ultimately lead you to develop your own taste and perspective on these things. And um, it, that's an experience that I've had where it's like, you know, wearing, you know, one Cartier leads me to the next Cartier that leads me to the next right. this, that, or the other thing. Um, so, yeah. Which which I think brings us to our first, you know, the first topic we want to talk about, which was the, the, the crash, right? Yeah. The, the, the Cartier crash was a watch. Um, obviously, I'm not telling you the history, just, you know, telling you know, the audience. Uh, in 1967, it was founded, uh, it was designed by the CEO of Cartier. I forget his name, Jean something, uh, Jean something Cartier. Uh, and, and to what I understand, those watches were not all that... Uh, desirable for for quite a long time. I don't know where they where they were uh, as far as auctions for for a while, but to my understanding, uh, those watches really have only blown up in the last you know ten years. Uh, am, am I am I right? Yeah, I think we have one uh, mega influencer to to uh, maybe kind of like point that towards, which is Kanye, right? So Kanye wears a oh, yeah. wears a crash. Um, he wears a nineteen ninety one, doesn't he? He does. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the watch is, is really interesting. The story behind it is is also really interesting too. Um, you know, there, yeah, there's you, kind you, of you you tell the story. You you tell the story. Well, the crash kind of resembles like the melting clocks in Salvador Dali's uh, the, the persistence, persistence of, of time. Mem- uh, yeah. The so, memory, memory, memory. Yeah. So it it, it kind of has like that Alice in Wonderland me kind of like look to it. Um, and what's interesting is there's another. Um, story about uh, this Cartier craftsman in London who um, received a watch after a woman had been in a, in a car crash. And so I, the right. story has it that the, the watch was, you know, mangled from this car crash. She was okay, but the, the watch right. was kind of like mangled. And I think the watch had uh, a sentimental value. And ultimately they tried to kind of like re repurpose this watch and then thus the crash kind of came as a result of this this kind of crash right the car crash so right um right. i think that's where the the name comes from and then that's the the, the ultimate history um so they made very very few of them I, I i mean i think in 67 there was like 267 of them made and then in 91 unlimited edition came out where they made uh 400, 400 pieces right? 400 okay I, I think it was four yeah Gotcha. And then uh, in 2016, uh, 67 pieces of them were made. And I think that was to kind of commemorate the, the initial crash London uh, of 1967. And that right. watch specifically is the skeletonized version. Um, and so, And yeah. now there's the examples at Bond Street and they're making, what, one a month, I think, right? I think so, yeah. It's a very low production watch for yeah. sure. They're definitely hard to find. I've had a good number of customers reach out and ask me to, to find Cartier's. And it's it's not one of those watches where it's like, I pick up the phone, call the network of vintage dealers and figure out who has right. what. <laughs> yeah, like, right, right. And, it's mo- like, and most guys that have them don't want to sell them. I mean, Eric Koo yeah. must have, I don't know. I mean, when I say seven, like it's probably conservative. He could have 10 or 12. Uh, I know he has a lot of them. That doesn't mean they're going to sell them though. Just because you know where one is doesn't mean it's for sale. And and when it comes 100%. to something as rare as that, you know, you know, a client, listen, you, a client could offer triple value and someone just doesn't want to sell it. You know, like, like the, the guy that, you know, the guy that has the watch, he already has the money you're offering him. He doesn't want, he doesn't, he wants the watch. Like, it's not like about the just because you're offering 3X <laughs> market, he doesn't want your money. Like he already has money. Like I don't, what I don't right. have is the watch if I sell it. Um, so, so I want to talk about that, 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 uh, that story for a second. Um, so I personally think that that Cartier uh, crash inception story is, is a total crock. Um, I think that I think that you know it, it makes perfect sense that uh, well first of all Salvador Dali was doing a partnership with Piaget at the time uh, in 1967. Uh, w- 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 the the collection that came of that partnership to me isn't attractive. Uh, it's it's I don't know I just don't really like the pieces. They're very gaudy um, and they're they're not the same Dali that you see in the, in the 30s in the persistence of uh, of memory like you said. Um, right. So what I think happened was you know the you know the Cartier designers or whatever they. He said, okay, you know, Dali's on the scene. How cool would that be? Well, we can't get him or, or we don't want him. But now they're thinking about Dali. Dali's in their head. 
okay, clock, he did a clock, let's do it. Then it kind of says, well, what does it look like if our whole thing is the fact that, our whole claim to fame is that we're master designers and we're stealing a design from someone else. So I think that that's when they decided to make up this, this story, this, you know, this story which has never actually been validated. Like, they've never even like said it out loud. It's kind of just been a, a, like a rumor. Uh, and, and the thing is, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with you know, if, if I'm right, if they did make up the story, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, the fact that they still created, the, the crash is still theirs. You know, they didn't, yeah. I mean, it's certainly inspired by persistence of memory, but it's not stolen. I mean, I, I think that it's still a, a traditional, I mean, Cartier design. And uh, I, I, I wish that there wasn't like the lie about it. In my opinion, it's a lie, I could be wrong. But, um, but I, I don't know, I don't know why it has to be so confusing, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, what's interesting is, um, you know, I think that there's there's this kind of weirdness with within the watch world where it's like, oh, like so-and-so copied so-and-so and so-and-so. Right. Like, I, I right. tend to look at it more as like an inspiration behind, unless it's like a blatant, a blatant like, replica copy. And then you're like, okay, I this is just a I completely agree with you. I but, completely agree with you. You know, look at look at the other Cartier designs. I mean, if you you know, they're very open about their tank normal. The whole idea, the original tank was the was the Renault tanks. What's yeah. wrong with that? Is it stolen from a tank? No, it's inspired by a tank. Uh, yeah. the tank I think it was also commemorating was, uh, that Chinese as well. Chinese temples. Right, yeah. exactly right. It's commemorate. And the, and the Chang Chinhua was Chinese temples and all these things. There's nothing wrong with, you know, with that. So, I don't know. Bottom line is the crash is definitely one of my favorites. Um, I don't know if I'll ever own one. They're a lot of money. Uh, they, they, they are. And uh, they are certainly uh, lower hanging fruit in the Cartier world that, I, that I'll want to hit first. For but sure. But, you know, what a hell of a watch, though. Incredible, yeah, from a design perspective and from a, a horological history perspective. I think it's very, very cool. Yeah. So you were talking before about Paul Newman. So, so I yeah. don't deal in Paul in, in Paul Newman's. I've never owned one. I've never sold one. So, so tell me right now, kind of where, like, what's the Paul Newman market like? And and as a as a follow up, you know, there are so, you know multiple different variations. So, what is the range? Like, what right now is like the low hanging Paul Newman, and and how secure are they? And then what are the grails out there right now? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So I actually have two Paul Newmans in front of me and I'll nice. kind of hold these up. So this is uh, kind of a nice little comparison. So if we start back, um, you know, kind of at the, at, the, at the first exotic or Newman dial, it would have been in a 6241 or a 6239. Um, mm -hmm. This is actually a 6262, which is a black dial Paul Newman 6262. And the thing that's interesting about the 6262 is that is a bit of a transitional model for Rolex is they were moving from the Valjoux 72 to the 727. So higher beats, gotcha. you know, uh, yeah. in, the, in the movement and a much more accurate chronograph, right? So you would obviously see a 727 in like a, you know, 6263 or 6265. And then I've got right. a 6241, um, which has you know, the acrylic or Bakelite bezel. And then um, this one is which in Which is, and that's a pump pusher reference, isn't it? Both of them are pump pushers, yeah. Gotcha. Um, which I actually tend to like. It's I, I'm not, you know, talking smack on screw down Daytonas at all. I love them, but I like actually operating the chronograph. Like I time, yeah, dumb stuff all the time with my chronographs, like parking yeah, meters yeah. and like whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know? yeah, right. Or right, like I'm looking at ways and I'm like, okay, it says 27 minutes, but let's see if it's really 27 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> yeah, right. So. Let's see if my antiquated chronograph, can, you know, like totally uh, that's, any excuse, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. But I, you know, to answer the question about Paul Newman, uh, it's definitely something that we specialize in. Um, it's an interesting market. Um, I actually, believe it or not, in today's market, get probably two or three messages a day, whether it be via direct message on our Instagram or uh, an email for people that have said, hey, I'm, I'm looking for a Paul Newman. Let me know if right, you have one. I'm in the one. market, right? Yeah. Um, I'm very selective in what in which Newmans I, I go after. I'm not just buying any, you know, Paul Newman, like, you know, you know, uh, being in the, right. in the same business. N not every single watch is, is created equal, even though it's a Paul Newman, even right. though it has, you know, it's the same production, et cetera, et cetera. Time has, right. an, has an effect on these things um, in terms of right. patina and overall quality. But I think the market is very strong. I mean, the Paul Newman Daytona, uh, regardless of the reference range, is an icon and is highly collectible. Mm -hmm. And 
I think regardless of what's happening to the market, there's always going to be a demand for these things because it, it is what it is. It's a Paul Newman. So yeah, I, I think that to elaborate on that a little bit more, what what you know, obviously there are a lot of different types of collectible Rolexes. There's a lot of nuances that make a, a particular piece exponentially more expensive than a, a, a brother or a sister. But to me, I, I, the more distinctive it is, is is certainly you know. Um, uh, just even more important than, than rarity, right? Paul Newman, next to a you know nor normal dial, non-exotic dial, it looks completely different, right? The totally. same way that uh, gilt dials look completely different than matte dials. Where where I get a little bit not not lost, I mean yeah, I can understand it, but where I get a little bit more skeptical is when we're talking about uh, you know particularly in the Submariner line these little little nuances that you really need to be a student of vintage Rolex to understand. For sure. <laughs> Whereas with with Paul Newman, you know. That has an appeal to anybody. I mean, anyone can understand. There were two di uh, two basic dial categories: exotic, non-exotic. Exotics are maybe you don't like them, but they are funky. They are crazy. They're bizarre. They weren't liked when they came out. It's a very easy narrative to tell. Um, whereas, you know, when you're talking about will the market ever wobble? I, I feel like the the really obscure stuff, depending on the rarity and whatever. That's the stuff that's going to be harder to be stabilized because you need to really make sure that there are enough people in the market then can understand it and then care. Just because you understand it doesn't mean you care. You know what I mean? For sure. Yeah. Means, like if, it's if you were so to compare that to subs, cool. right? Like you were saying, it's like, okay, you, you have maxi, you know, dial 5513s, right? You have maxi mark one, maxi mark two, maxi right. mark, and you're like, Okay, right. so the so the text is slightly different, and the equal sign and yeah, the right, depth like, rating is slightly to the right or slightly yeah. to the left, and then the loom exactly plots are exactly right. Hundred percent. You know, with a with a Paul Newman, for example, it, it is distinctively different, right? You look at a normal six two four one or a normal six two three nine, for example, um, versus a, a Paul Newman or an exotic dial, and they are yep. they are different watches to a uh, you can, know. It can, Completely different, and whether you like it or don't, I happen to love them. Um, not not to say that I don't love uh, don't love non non exotics. I mean, uh, you know, to me, the the, the six two six three, you know, yellow gold with the black dial is oh. a, it's six two six three, right? That's a phenomenal watch. Most uh, definitely. I love, and that's not and that's not a Paul Newman, you know, but but phenomenal. Um, but yeah, it, it was Paul Newman market's never one I got into. Um, I'm I, I don't know. I, I just never. My, my big thing, my company's only five years old, and and you know I was always very cautious in getting into you know the the, the big the bigger game, right? Because sure. you know you really need to you know be a student of those particular models. You know when pe you know, people love to say, oh, you know Rolex expert, this expert, but really, you know I I think when you're talking to someone, it's much more appropriate to say, no, they're a, they're a Paul Newman expert, right? Calling someone a Rolex expert, I mean that, that's that's really I mean. That's a huge, huge statement. You know what right. I mean? Like it's it's so broad. But um, but when you're talking about the nuances in individual models, I know people that know the you know the Explorer twos, the vintage Explorer twos, 1655, better than yep. anybody. And they're not really well schooled in in Paul Newman's, and they won't touch one without the approval of a third party. You know, uh, 100%. yeah, that, that's 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 really how everyone needs to be. I'm sure you're the same way. Um, but yeah, I feel like when I, people are getting into this game for the first time, especially when they have a lot of money, they they want to just buy, 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 buy. They think they know what they're talking about. Right. They, you know, maybe they think they know better than the dealers, and it's very dangerous. Hundred percent. I mean, uh, you know, I, I go into the, like the craziest details, especially with something like a like a Paul Newman, right? Like I, right. I've spent hours with these watches. I'm, you know, hours right. looking at different dial variants across the reference range, looking at consistency oh, and yeah. in, in luminous material. Um, yep. you know, cr crazy stuff like that where, you know, again, that's where I think guys like us fill the, the, the bridge in terms of somebody that wants to buy and own versus somebody that wants to validate and like bring a piece into the market and et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, so, so and, yeah. And like I, you said, like t holding watches and that's another thing that people in the digital, you know, obviously the internet has, has, has given, you know, an opportunity for, for all of us to become so much more, you know, educated in this field than we otherwise would have been because there's so much information out there. Um, but there's also, there are also many people out there that think because they read a couple of forums and, and threads that they know these references and models and you've got to be very careful. You know, hold, there's, there's really no substitute for holding a lot of these watches. I mean, I'll go to this example, you know, um, 
case refinishing, laser welding has become a really big thing. I don't mind it at all. I actually, I, I actually think that it's, it's a great service. Um, I, I think it's unfortunate that a lot of people are not disclosing that information. That's, sure. that's a problem. Um, but it is a great service, right? But to me, it's only a great service when that welding is not just sharp and not just brushed and polished, but like, for example, when the, when the bevels are the right size. Right? For sure. And I see a lot of these Rolexes, these vintage subs or GMTs that are becoming like, you know, uh, exaggerated. And now you're, you're not restoring it back to Rolex spec. You know, you're actually just making a different case with different personality. For uh, sure. That I have a problem with. And unless you actually deal with this stuff and have held it, you're just going to say, oh, bevels, check. Oh, brushing, check. Polish, check. You don't right. actually know what it should look like and feel like. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think that there, in my response to that and to add a little bit of color there, I think there's a couple of different things. One, um, you know, I, I'm kind of of the same thought. I definitely would obviously prefer to buy stuff that is like one owner, left in the drawer for 30 years, never worn, right. perfect, hyperbaric chamber in the package. Like, yeah, yeah, okay, you know. <laughs> right? Realistic, but some of these yeah. watches were tool watches. So sometimes I'm even looking for that use, that patina. Like, was this watch worn on a strap? Was this watch worn on the bracelet? How does, every, how does everything yeah. look? Does the patina yeah. on the case match the patina on the bracelet? Does the, exactly right. does the bezel, is it telling me that, that right story, right? And some of these watches were polished and I think that that's not a total deal breaker. There's a lot of people that are like unpolished everything. And then, you know, you, you put two watches in front of those people and you're like, which one's the factory one and which one's the one that's been right. restored? And they're like, I, I don't right. know, right? So, uh, um, yeah. and I think there's a lot of people, uh, I think this is a benefit, but also um, a, kind of a bummer about the, the day and age that we're in. There's a lot of keyboard warriors, right? Like. E why, why do I know about Paul Newman's? Because I've handled a ton of them. Why do I know that this watch is unpolished right. versus not? Because I've, I've sat there with a loop and I'm you know, getting into those, into those details. Um, right. But to kind of bring that again full circle, I think you're, de you're definitely right. It's about experience re re relating to, um, I guess you could call it like putting lipstick on a pig. I'm, I'm like if a case has been recut or whatever, we'll, we'll disclose that in the listing and ultimately let the next owner make that decision whether or not that's something that they want to do. I've actually had customers right. that have purchased watches and then said, hey, you know, what do you think about maybe, you know, doing a laser weld on this or, yeah. or doing the case or whatever? And I kind of leave it up to that next, next owner. Um, and right. I think some of this stuff too is it's like, you know, if you compare it to like the vintage car market a little bit, obviously like the original paint and, you know, right. original everything is, is desirable, but there are certain instances where you're like, okay, this is one of five cars and it's rusty and it looks like crap. Uh, right. It probably makes sense to send that to a specialist and have them restore it to spec to, to bring that back. So I'm kind of in the, in the, in the same boat, I think, as, as you. I think um, if somebody's like, like doing that stuff to you know, enhance something, I, I'm, that's for sure frowned upon. But if somebody discloses that and, and, and uh, is open about it, and I think in some cases it can actually accent a, a watch properly and um, Absolutely. bring it back, you know? Absolutely. What I what I basically what I usually do with with watches that uh, would benefit from from a, from a laser welding or something, um, I don't I don't do it uh, for a lot of reasons. One, honestly, just because because I don't want to hold up the watch in a process like that for an extended period of time. But sure. what you know, what I'll tell a client when they're considering buying it is, hey, you know, you can explore that option on your own, and I'll help you with it. I mean, I'll I'll make the introductions and I'll do all these things for you. Um, sure. But ultimately, you know, uh, there's no reason why you should go in many instances, go buy someone else's laser welded watch when we can take this same thing. If you want to do that, then you can do it. Uh, there's, sure. there's no reason, you know, there's no reason not to. That's your thing. Uh, personally, I had my dad's uh, a date just welded, you know, and, and it, it came absolutely terrific. It was a lovely, lovely job. Uh, and, and it was a 1601, like a regular like common old, sure. you know, it was a yellow gold watch, wonderful job. And I don't regret it for a second. Uh, yeah. But uh, but it is an interesting topic because technology is getting so good. I just wanted to throw in one more thing before we segue out of the 
Paul Newman. I forgot. Sure. I have I have right now uh, one of those old Singer dials uh, labeled Croton in one of those uh, like cushion cases with you okay. know with the Paul Newman exotic sub dials. It's such right. a fun watch. I've had this watch for like two years, and I honestly I forgot that I had it. I had it at the bank, and I just forgot. <laughs> and I went to the bank the other day, and I said, "Oh, oh shit, this will be great." I, you know, like, wow, I'm glad I have this. So yeah. uh, anyway, it's a it's a cool there, piece. Those Singer dials are cool, and you can definitely find like that that Paul Newman esque type of like uh, you know. Uh, Art Deco font and kind of that lollipop yeah. marker subset, you know, exactly in other right. watches. Uh, Lip made yep. a bunch of watches that had the Singer Singer dials with that, you know, lollipop mm -hmm. kind of exotic racing dial. Long jeans actually did as well. Um, yep. So they're they're re they're really cool, you know. Um, yeah. So that's awesome. I, I I like watches like that. One of the cool you know stories that I that I have, uh, I I went to Oktoberfest. I went to Germany and I went to Spain and Barcelona Madrid with my best friend uh, this past uh, September. Right, and I said, okay, what what watch do I bring? I really only want to bring one watch. I'm you know I'm going away. God knows what what, what we're gonna do. I mean, God knows, right? I really should only have one right. watch and be responsible for that. I, I don't even know if I'm gonna come up with my. By shoes. the way, that's a, that's a funny thought to have, right? Because you're like, okay, I'm going away. Like, what watch am I gonna bring? Because I could be like, it's it's kind of like that James Bond moment where you're yeah. like, well, you know, I could be in the pool. Well, I could go, I could go on out on, you know, out on the town. Like, oh right. man, if I'm only bringing one, what do I bring? <laughs> what do you, what do you, what do you bring? You know, what's the watch that if you happen to have, you know, if you happen to bring your new friends from Germany back to your apartment, uh, that you're gonna hide under a, a pillow? You know what I mean? Under a cushion? You know what I mean? Right. Like it's all these funny things, you know. And uh, and anyway, I chose to bring a, a watch in my collection that my my mom and dad actually gave me for my, I think it was 21st birthday. It was a vintage. Omega Seamaster, a lovely watch, cool. and and I said, you know, one, it's it's super versatile. It, it'll it'll serve me well for the whole trip. But really, the coolest part about bringing that watch, w you know, was. I've ha I had had that watch for three years at that point, and I wear that watch a couple times a month, let's say you know three or four times a month. But because I'm always wearing so many other watches, I never had a chance to really bond with that watch like the way that I did with my first watch, my Datejust, right? So I said, wow, this is a tr tremendous opportunity to develop, that sounds weird, but you, you know what I mean, develop a relationship yeah. with this thing. And of course <clears throat> I did. Like, like uh, you know, having quote unquote mass in Munich, you know, these huge beer glasses and my hand aching because, you know, because of all the weight, you know what I mean? I couldn't even hold it after <laughs> nine hours and saying, okay, I have to go to the bathroom, but I'm looking at the watch. What time is it? You know? And I, it's just such a great, like, it's such a great like, series of memories. And um, again, it's, 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 it's one of the best things about collecting watches. Yeah, I mean, no doubt, and that's the and that's the thing that's interesting too is you know I've had the fortunate opportunity to to travel the world for watches, and there are watches in my collection that I, you know, they're to me they're just priceless because I've had that experience with it, and I look at it and I'm like, oh man, I remember when I was here with this, or I remember doing this with that, and it's kind of like this interesting thing that happens where you know, you look at something uh, and it kind of brings back this like photographic memory, that, you know, it's like, I can smell th that again, I can taste that again, I can fe I can see all that stuff again. Mm -hmm. um, and it's through something that is like, you know, it's just on your wrist, you know? Right. It, so I, I totally get that. And sometimes it, what's interesting is like, I'll chase down a watch like that and then I have all these experiences with it and I'm like, oh God, like, yeah, right. like that, you know, it's like, it's like sending your child yeah. off to college when you send it, you're like, yeah. oh, okay, I'm going to miss you, you know? <laughs> yeah, oh, 100%. I know when I've had certain moments in my life, meetings that, that I knew were, you know, were career defining at the time and, and, and still till today, I look back and say, wow, that, that was, that was a great meeting, whatever it might be. I always, you know, I, and I, I thank myself, I've always been smart enough to wear one of my own watches. And and it's tempting sometimes when you have these really important moments because you know you want to wear some of the the, 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 the quote unquote most collectible and best watches you own, but those watches are for my inventory and they will eventually you know find a new home. And I said, you know, do I totally. really want you know that memory to be shared with a watch that's going to end up in Singapore? You know, like you know, that's someone else's watch. It's a client's watch. Let me wear my Datejust, even though you know it's, yeah. it, it was while well, it's you know a great watch, a great watch was not the most expensive watch I had you know in my you know in my possession at the time. 
time. But I'm just glad that I'm glad that I did it. And that being said, some horrible things I'm sure have happened to both of us wearing our watches, you know, or or even wearing uh, wearing watches we inevitably sold. You know, you don't know. Sometimes you're taking a photo of a watch, and you know you're having a great day, and then something bad happens, and then ultimately you're like, I'm glad I'm selling that one because you know I don't even want to remember. I reminded of that horrible, you know. But, you know what's uh, funny too is I've I've, I've it, it's kind of a double-edged sword on this side, and, and I don't know if you'll share the same feeling, but I, you know, I'll meet with a customer, and uh, he's interested, you know, I'm going to talk about a specific watch, and I'll, and I'll have something on, and then he's interested in what it is that I'm wearing. Yeah, and right. I've had that, had that moment where I'm like, oh, this, this, this one's mine, you know, it's not for sale, but how much? Well, how about this much? Well, how about that much? And then I'm like, right. then I'm like, oh, crap, like, I don't want to, you know, piss off my customer or my friend, but like, right. this one's mine, you know? Right. And then he's offering, <laughs> yeah. Which I think in some cases makes things that much more desirable, but you know, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I share that same sentiment and uh, feeling with, you know, watches kind of, uh, you know, it was, it was interesting. I watched one of your videos where you did like an overview of uh, the Bourdain watches, which were really interesting. And Anthony yeah. had a really good kind of thought behind a watch that was gifted to him by his father. Um, and uh, I thought that was cool. That kind of, that, that stuck with me uh, where you were talking about, um, you know, a, a, an energy being in something. He understood how much watches can mean, how, 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 how they can serve as these vessels for people and, and memories and time. He seems like the kind of guy that thought so into it, like, like so many of us, that he even viewed this little old oyster perpetual thing as, in this way, um, my movement, you know, now powers a watch that was once powered by my dad, you know? Not everyone thinks of it like that. I couldn't agree more, and that's part of what makes this, you know, whole hobby so much fun. But we're going to segue out of this episode, Cam. And we're yep. going to resume this um, just in a few days with everybody else. So if you all like this episode, please, Cameron, tell them where to find you. Yeah, you can find us at craftandtailored.com, on Instagram, at craftandtailored, and then uh, YouTube as well. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. It's at craftandtailored. Provide a link in the description below. I'm so glad you came out, man. We're definitely going to do this again. Well, we have episode two coming out in a few days, but even after that, uh, I'm looking forward to this. Talking Watches is a blast, and uh, I'm sure everyone loved the episode. Thanks for having me, Christian. appreciate it. Everyone, uh, thank you for watching the video. If you liked it, go ahead and like it. If you love watches, subscribe to our channel and check out the Theo and Harris Watch Shop. See you all soon.